Our next speaker is Ramona Caponegro. She's already been introduced to you today and I'm gonna do it again in case you came in a little late. Uh, Ramona is the curator of the Baldwin Library of Historical Children's Literature here at UF. Previously, she was a professor of children's literature at Eastern Michigan University. She has published essays about children's book awards, picture books and early readers and representations of incarceration. She serves on multiple children's book award committees, including the Caldecott Committee, and was the co-edit writer of the documentary film, Tell Me Another Story about diversity in picture books. Her talk today is entitled, Down the Archival Rabbit Hole, A Glimpse into the Depths of the Baldwin. Okay, so this is just going to be the very, very top layer of the Baldwin. We're going to be exploring the Baldwin through focusing on the Alice things. And some of the Alice things will lead us into what are some of the other special areas within the Baldwin that you may want to come back and do research on at some point. So the Baldwin has over 120,000 items ranging from the mid 1600s to today with approximately 7,000 items fully digitized and available on UFDC, University of Florida Digital Collection. So lots of great archival materials that you can read without actually having to come to campus. And we have over 300 Carol items in the Baldwin. If you are here tomorrow, you will get a chance to see more of them in the before the tea upstairs in the grand reading room. If you are joining us in Zoom, please come to Florida and see all the Carol things at some point. So in terms of Alice, the oldest edition of Alice in the Baldwin is from 1866. A note on the back of the title page describes the book as the first New York edition, though the UF catalog notes that according to Williams Lewis Carroll's handbook, it's the second American edition of the first issue, second American issue of the first edition. And from what I could make out on the inscription of the following page, it was a Christmas gift to Kitty Clover from her aunt in 1869. The most recent item we have, we just got a couple of weeks ago, and it's the 2022 Chris Riddell's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland with Through the Looking Glass coming out in 2023 from him. So that's the scope of our Alice things. In terms of how we got any of this going, the library was started almost unintentionally by Ruth Baldwin, or in some ways by Ruth Baldwin's mother. Um, when Ruth Baldwin was 35, her mother and her father were in England on a trip, and her mom sent her a small collection of chapbooks as a belated birthday present. And she really, really liked them and thought, this is a thing, I could do this. So her mom kept sending more things on the trip. And by the time they got home from that first trip, there were about a thousand children's books and chat books. Ruth was hooked, her mother was hooked. There were going to be many more book buying trips in their future. Ruth was a library science professor at Louisiana State University where she taught library management, not children's literature. But she was spending her free time and any extra money she could scrape together on buying children's books and collecting them and keeping them all in her house. At some point, she realized this was a potential fire hazard and she was starting to think about her legacy. So she started shopping for a university that would be interested in all of the books. And that was what brought her and the books together, they were a package deal, to the University of Florida. So Ruth and about 35,000 children's books showed up in 1977. She was the first curator. And before she retired, she added another 50,000 books to the collection. There have been a lot of stories, both published and anecdotally told about Ruth and her determination to make sure that this was an incredible collection and that it was exactly the way she wanted it. Do not get between the way of Ruth Baldwin and a children's book if she is interested. I think everyone learned that very, very quickly. But that tenacity really is what gave us the collection that we have. 
And Ruth's collecting philosophy was a little different than a lot of special collections. So as Rita Smith in an article about her noted, she wanted the volumes that were loved and read by children and so ordinary that no one else collected them. So with that in mind, you get things in the Baldwin, like a copy of Alice in Wonderland that you apparently got for free when you bought two pounds of Folgers coffee. I could start drinking coffee if it came with children's books. I also think it's hilarious that, you know, tea party, but I'm guessing coffee party in this particular instance. We also have things like this 2016 bilingual coloring book that has captions in both English and Akan, a language spoken largely in Ghana. So she next met and looked up the large grin of the Cheshire cat and the about the book notes that this is for raising your children in a bilingual fashion, sharing the magic and beauty of Alice in Wonderland story along with a dual language storytelling environment. So a lot of these things are things you would not necessarily find in a lot of other places. As Ruth said, I do not always keep the best copy. I keep the inscribed and labeled one, the one used by children. A mint copy tells me nothing of the book. And not only may the mint copy not tell you about the book, but even more importantly, it might not tell you anything about the readers who are actually engaging with the book. And so many of the books in the Baldwin are full of all of these tiny clues about the personalities and ages and developmental stages of the readers, as well as the people who are frequently gifting them the books. So you've got the scribblers <laughs> who find their own way to bring color <laughs> to the illustrations, as well as the ones who do a fairly good job of coloring in between the lines. And I have to say, it's nice to see Alice in a bright orange dress for a change. Also, I can take this all in stride because these are not my books. And they're also not the books within the Baldwin. At this point in the grand reading room, no pens, no crayons. We love it when they come in with things like this. We do not allow patrons to add things like this once the books are here. You also have the diarists and the reporters, whom I really, really love. So at the beginning of this very, very abridged version of the Pleasant Hours series, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which has, according to the record, a sort of questionable publication date of about 1900. By reading the front page, I learned that Adelaide received this book as a gift. It was apparently given at two o'clock, started at 122, little not sure about that, on March 10th, 1915, finished March 11th, 1915 at three o'clock. <laughs> And for better or for worse, her reading speed could have been impacted by the fact that she was apparently sick in bed at the time that she was reading this. And also that her sister was sick, or she calls her sis, and then adds a little note, lest anyone be confused, that sis means sister. Also, someone decided that the inside cover was a good place to practice multiplication. And then you get to see the different book plates over time. The first one is in an 1890 edition. The second one is in an approximately 1955 juvenile deluxe edition. And I have to say the Jiffy thing has also created some questions. I last lived in Michigan, very close to the Jiffy corn muffin manufacturing. They give out corn muffin when you graduate there. And so Jiffy means something possibly different to a person in central Michigan than it does to everyone else. But yes, the Jiffy definitely entertains me. And you get to read the inscriptions that are in books. So learning that Josephine Dora got this copy of Alice, it's a 1952 edition, Prince Charming color book for children to be exact, um, in 1956 for a christening from a great aunt. or that Miriam got this copy of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland published in 1910 
as a very Merry Christmas to a dear little pupil from her teacher. Levity aside, these editions give us such rich insights into the lives of their readers and the people who loved them and gave them books. They encourage us to ask questions, like was it common for teachers to give books to children as Christmas gifts? Or what might this gift tell us about Miriam, about her teacher, about her school experience, about the town in which she grew up? So many of these Alice's, along with a lot of the other books in the Baldwin, are so common that collecting and preserving them is rare. That being said, as much as this is a huge part of the Baldwin, and we all get really excited when we find a book that isn't in WorldCat or that hasn't been saved by any other institution, you know, we also have the books that are of a different, more collectible type that have been added to the Baldwin, first by Ruth after she came to UF, and then by Rita Smith and Susan Altieri, the next curators in the collection. So that we do have things like an edition that's illustrated by Arthur Rackham from 1907 with the colored plates on the thick heavy brown paper with the guard sheets. Students love the, guard, the tissue paper guard sheets and getting to flip those. Um, this was one of a limited edition and the Baldwin has number 822 out of 1100 editions on sale in Great Britain, Ireland and the colonies, along with 30 copies for presentation. We also have an oversized book illustrated by Salvador Dali from 1969. Again, students love this because it's huge. It looks really impressive when you carry it out and put it down on a table. It's also really hard when all of the different pieces get scattered and you've got to then figure out how you're going to get them put back together. I will learn the order of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland really well from this activity. And the lobster quadrille illustration within this is one that has gotten a lot of student interest. A couple of the classes that have come in, this is one of the illustrations they really gravitate towards and spend a lot of time trying to compare this with the story and any other illustrations that they've seen or that are around the other books in the Baldwin that they're looking at. Something I didn't even realize we had until I was pulling books for tomorrow's session is an Alice's Adventures Underground, a gorgeous blue box cover. Again, 220 standard and 22 special copies with signed prints by the colorist. And we at Baldwin has copy number 18. So it's this variety of the things that, different meanings of rare and collectible that really come through. And Daniel Hirsch talked about Ruth as a collector and a book lover. Dr. Baldwin felt that all books in their various editions were equally valuable. She felt that for a research collection to truly be such, it had to represent the printing history of each title from the first editions to the inexpensive trade editions to the later cheap reprints or editions gobbled up by children of all means. And so with this, comparative editions are really one of the Baldwin's riches. I mentioned we have over 300 Alice books along with other books by Lewis Carroll. We also have several hundred Robinson Crusoe, over 100 A Child's Garden and Verses. We have popular series books like Nancy Drew that you can see as the cover changes, the design changes, the quality of the book changes decade by decade. And even lots of different printings of little golden books. If you ever want to see the saggy baggy elephant or the pokey little puppy and how the color changes slightly, printing to printing to printing to printing to printing, the Baldwin has you covered. So, I mean, really getting to look at all of these different editions and versions and adaptations, you can focus on the different illustrations, changes in writing and storytelling, both over time and between the American and British editions. We have some foreign language editions, but most of our books are published in English, English either from the UK or in the United States. And one of my favorite things is the changes in the marketing practices, getting to see the publishers advertisements and blurbs and promos and how those change in the books over time as well. And getting to look at things that may stand out in a particular edition that 
you don't see in the others, such as the inclusion of orders. So this is a 1926 Sears illustrated juvenile version of both Alice's in one book. And it's one of several books from especially the 20s and 30s that had very lavishly illustrated borders instead of having illustrations included. But this is the only Alice book in the Baldwin where the borders go through a four page rotation. So you're seeing scenes from both Alice books on the borders, even if that scene doesn't fit where you actually might be. So Alice's Adventures in Wonderland starts with the Tweedles and the White Knight. Interesting, which again asks some questions about who is making some of the choices and putting the art and the text together and how much were they reading Alice and thinking things through. But just as the personal touches added by readers and gift givers tell the story of a particular book and life, doing these comparative examinations of many copies of the same story tell us the story of the life of that book and the ongoing story of the publishing market and where this book fits in within it. Ruth Baldwin is our namesake and the reason the library is here, but I also want to talk about another important person in the Baldwin's archives, Louise Seaman Bechtel. She was the head of the first children's book department at an American publisher, Macmillan. She was hired in 1919 to start what was then called the Department of Books for Boys and Girls. And she was heading up the department, but at the same time as a woman in 1919, she was not officially made the head of the department. So she got the work and the unofficial title, but not the actual official title. And Macmillan was the largest English language publisher when she was hired. And of course, Alice, it's Macmillan, Alice was a part of her backlist. So one of her big things as she came into this job is that she created the first catalog specifically focused on children's books. So Macmillan had children's books like Alice, but frequently they were in the catalog with everything else. There were no distinguishing things between children's books, adult books. All of the books in the catalog were just put in backlist, new things. It was apparently just a chaotic list of hundreds of titles. And she was the first to really sift through it and claim as the new department of, for boys and girls, claim the children's books and create an, her own catalog. Now that seems pretty common to us today. We're all probably used to looking at book catalogs that have focuses, but this was revolutionary at the time. And not only did she come up with the lists of, okay, here are the Macmillan's books for children, but she also did themes, she did subjects, she incorporated illustrations, quotes, reviews, photos of authors and illustrators. So she was really starting her catalogs as almost a, a journal of what was going on in Macmillan's children's literature. And this is something that, again, is very commonplace now, but this was the first time we really saw this happening. And her first catalog came out in 1920, featuring Arthur Rackham's illustrations though not for Alice since that was not a Macmillan thing at this time. Alice was on her backlist though, and she was very, very aware of that. So as the head of the department, she was always looking for new ways to promote the older, work, older works on the backlist while also editing and publishing newer works. And in 1930, so 11 years after she started in the job, she published a new edition of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass as part of one of the series she created, Macmillan's Children's Classics. And this series promoted the great works, so-called, for children by American and British creators. And it also offered age recommendations for first readings. Again, something a little new at this time. And she placed Alice within the range for eight to 10 year old readers. So besides repackaging classics like Alice and some of the other things that you can read on this, lots of familiar titles here. She also did a number of other important firsts as she was creating her list of more contemporary books. She published Popo, Popo and Fafina, written by Arna Bontemps and Langston Hughes and illustrated by E. Sims Campbell. And it was the first prose work in a picture book 
for children by black authors published by a mainstream press. She also did the first photo documentary book for kids, which is still an important part of nonfiction. It was Lewis Hines, Men at Work, who was, Lewis Hines, of course, was really well known for his photos of strikes, child laborers, adult laborers. And so this was the first photojournalism book for kids. And big, big deal, she edited three consecutive Newbery winners. So The Trumpeter of Krakow, Kitty, Her First Hundred Years, and The Cat Who Went to Heaven, 1929 through 1931. All three Newberries went to her, the authors, and Macmillan. And again, Newberry is the major award in children's literature published in the United States. So, and every publishing house still wants their book to be the one that gets the Newberry, the Caldecott, et cetera, because it's going to bring in so much publicity and sales. And to have three years in a row as your house getting the top award. And this is before the Caldecott had been created. So really this is the only award in American children's lit. That was huge in terms of really cementing Macmillan as a driving force in children's literature and making it clear to people at Macmillan that children's literature needed to be its own department. And other publishers, of course, were then also very quickly following suit and setting up their own children's departments so that they could get in on some of this action as well. She retired, well, and that's kind of in quotes. She retired from Macmillan reluctantly in 1934, but the last catalog she recalls working on was in 1932, celebrating the Alice books. So Lewis Carroll's Alice in honor of her 67th birthday as a book child with a new copy of a facsimile of Alice's Adventures Underground being released to honor it. And you can see here her notes about, this is the last cat catalog made by me reflects the re-entrenchments due to depression. The 1934 catalog had many books I had planned in it, but I left the company in January, 1934. She also asked, where is 1933? Which is a really good question if you're trying to find that catalog. Um, so at this time as she's leaving and this for her last catalog is coming out, her list included approximately 600 titles, back lists and front lists, and that was really impressive. After leaving Macmillan, she would continue to be a force in children's literature. She would review books, go on the lecture series, talking about children's books, write articles, and ended up editing at the Horn Book, one of the early journals about children's literature for quite a while. And also judging by her scrapbook, and the number of files and articles that she saved, children's books remain one of the driving things in her life. She actually has a scrapbook devoted to Alice and Carol. And she's collected articles here that are published between the 1930s and the 1970s. Everything from Alice Liddell's visit to the US in 1932, biographical sketches of Carol and Liddell, the Disney films release, stage versions, a book review of the 1960 annotated Alice, the Carol memorabilia moving to the New York University Library in 1975. So, I mean, an entire scrapbook of decades of collecting the articles that she had found. Clearly, Carol was a big interest, not just for publishing, but for her as well. She did have some other authors and illustrators she did this for too, Beatrix Potter being the other person who had almost as many pages as Carol. But two of the things that I absolutely loved in her scrapbook that I hadn't seen before were Alice the Charm Doll. Alice popped out of the rabbit hole on December 24th, Eastern Standard Time by the rabbit's watch and chain. Oh, my ears and whiskers, how pretty she's gotten. We heard the rabbit say as he hurried away. The rabbit was right. Her skin is felt. She wears her blue sateen dress, organdy apron, white stockings, and shiny slippers. And her long golden hair is real. Alice curtsies delightedly to learn that she has been chosen to be the charm doll, all in capitals. And to know that now every child may have a real Alice in Wonderland. One, I love that it's every child, not just every girl. 
And also this was $5. <laughs> Another item I had not seen before anywhere else was a Christmas card. This one looks very homemade to me. Um, but there's a note under it in Bechtel's writing observing that a very popular Christmas card of the 1950s. And I had not realized Alice had become a 1950s Christmas card in this way before. Another thing to mention in terms of Bechtel, not only did she leave a lot of her papers and manuscripts to us here in the Baldwin, she also has a large collection at Vassar because that's where she went to school. But she also has, we have an endowment, the Louise Seaman Bechtel Endowment, and it allows for one to two librarians, working youth services librarians to come to campus every year and do a project studying things in the Baldwin. And then also we have a research grant project tied with Louise Seaman Bechtel. Because of COVID, we've been a little bit in hiatus. We're trying to catch the 2019-2020 recipients up right now, but we will be reopening it for new applications. So continue to check the Baldwin website. And if you're interested in coming back and spending a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month in the Baldwin doing research, you know, definitely consider applying for one of the Louise Seaman Bechtel fellowships. They're really handy. In terms of Alice, and again, representing how Alice sort of infiltrates and represents many different parts of the Baldwin, I wanted to highlight the nursery Alice in terms of the desire, Carol's desire to reach younger readers, a new market, because early readers are a huge part of the Baldwin. So in his preface, addressed to any mother, and my ambition now, is it a vain one, to be read by children aged not to five, to be read, nay, not so, say rather to be thumbed, to be cooed over, to be dog-eared, to be rumpled, to be kissed, by the illiterate, ungrammatical, dimpled darlings that fill your nursery with merry uproar, and your inmost heart of hearts with a restful gladness. So all of this description to me sounds much more like a board book. And we've got plenty out there, you know, at this point, there are at least about half a dozen Lewis Carroll board books so that you can chew on them and thumb through them and almost destroy them, but hopefully they will make it through the toddler years. And so if you look at our display in the lobby, we have some of the board books there. And then we also have a few more of the board books upstairs. But Alice has been retold to younger readers a number of times in terms of adapting the language and cutting out the text, simplifying the story. But because I really like early readers and the sort of complex mix of education and entertainment that you see a lot in early readers, two of the Alice books that have really caught my attention have been the Alice's Adventures in Wonderland retold in words of one syllable. This is from 1905 with Mrs. J.C. Gorham, and it's part of Bert's series of one-syllable books, and it's all retold classics, as well as things like Lives of the Presidents, um, and supposedly all retold in words of one syllable. There's some fudging. You still get Alice. You get names that are not words of one syllable, with a little dash showing where the syllable break would be. Um, so this copy I found on Project Gutenberg, and I know they did a reprint in 2010 for anyone who missed it the first time around and now wanted to come back. But one I, that the Baldwin has that I have not found as much about as I have with the 1905 one is this one, which came out three years later from Saulfield Publishing. And again, it's stressing the idea of words of one syllable seems very much to be playing with Gorham's entire series. But it's the text, it's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, a common text that matched up very nicely with my Puffin edition. Um, and the whole thing is just the Alice text broke with little dashes between every single syllable of the entire book. Which is fascinating if you think that this was supposedly going to incentivize reading and learning to read in an early reader format. So interesting to see what methods have stayed and which have not. Early readers, as we think of them more today, 
really came about in the late 1950s, 1957 to be exact. And now you can find hundreds and hundreds of books that are more in this style that see much more the contemporary early reader. This one's from 2020. Focus on levels, not usually being as concerned about syllable counting, but everything gets its own word and broken down. I'm also just entertained because of course, Disney has the Disney villain series for young adults. You can read 400 page novels about different Disney villains, including the Queen of Hearts, but there is also the Disney villains early reader series so that you can start exploring villainy in Disney movies very early and keep going all through your reading experiences. So I know I am the thing basically standing between you and lunch. So I'm going to rush through a little bit, but you know, again, the idea is that if you, the different Alice things, and for those of you who will be here tomorrow, you'll get to see them, other people in Zoom, I hope you will come back and see, but the Baldwin has lots of movable books. As Felipe showed you, we've got our Alice movable books. The Baldwin has done a lot with building nonfiction. We have biographies of Carol written for kid audiences over different periods of about 80 years. Series books, a lot of the books that are inspired by Alice that are more contemporary are in series, which I love both the fantasy series where Queen of Hearts, Mad Hatter, someone new is popping into Wonderland and having adventures. We'll get to talk or hear from L.L. McKinney about her YA fantasy trilogy tonight but also these series like The Babysitter's Club where all of a sudden you have an Abbey in Wonderland and it's Alice in Wonderland being introduced in a series that's about babysitting and not really about Alice in Wonderland at all, but there's a play in one book and suddenly everyone's getting a Wonderland experience for that one book in the series that's very focused on other things. It's the only one I did not buy of all the new adaptations and inspirations I was looking at this summer. So an eight-year-old me would have loved the most. I was a big Babysitter's Club fan, but the cheapest copy is over $900 to get a uh. used one. And I decided we didn't probably need it that badly right now. We'll see. But I mean, Alice really does interweave throughout so many of the different sections and areas of the Baldwin. And when you got your name tag, et cetera, there, I had some flyers up because I did want to let you know that B is for Baldwin, an alphabet tour of the Baldwin Library of Historical Children's Literature just came out this summer. You can either order the book print on demand or it's available fully free and downloadable on, through UF. If you pick up one of the, I mean, you can find it just through Google, but also if you pick up one of the flyers, I think it has a QR code. It will take you right to the free digital version. And the B is for Baldwin collection just gives you a chance to explore a lot more of what are some of the treasures and special things in the Baldwin that Alice gets in there quite a bit too, but also what else do we have that isn't as necessarily as tied to Alice. So if you're interested in the collection, this is a great resource to start picking up some other, some other possibilities for research you might wanna do here. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions if people have some. There's a, oh. Off the top of your head, do you know what the biggest and the smallest books in the collection are and what, how big they are? Or if you don't know the titles, just like give us a scale. I do not. Rita, do you know? Do you remember? I mean, with. I would say the biggest one is probably the Dali, Alice, because that's a very, very big book. Um, the smallest ones, I mean, we have some that are about an inch 
And we have a cabinet of curiosities that, that are about two inches high. So this, you know, the range of size of books is just amazing. So did you say all the books are in English, none are foreign language at all? Some are in foreign language, but predominantly it's an English collection. Okay. Interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. What about books that are Alice in Wonderland, but they're not titled Alice in Wonderland because they're based in different cultures. Like there is a Korean book called Sun He's Adventures Under the Land of the Morning Calm. It's an Alice in, Wo Alice in Wonderland story, but it's all based in Korean culture, you know, mythology and all that. Like, are you also considering those types of books? I certainly would. I don't think we have any right now in the collection, but I certainly would, yeah a lot more room for adaptation and comparative study. The illustrator of that book would be here. I was just going to say that Byron Souls, the guy that illustrated that book, sung here, and uh, he should be here. As a lot of people in here know to their joy and sorrow, being interested in children's literature means lots of things that are book adjacent. How does the Baldwin draw the line with yes, well, like, do you do a coloring book? Do you, you know, where, where do you have non book items? And if so, how do you deal with them? <laughs> we definitely have non book items. Um, you saw the coloring book. We have some toy feeders, we have some paper dolls. So there are we have a lot of pop-ups and movables, which really blur that line sometimes between book and toy and where exactly is it. So we do have a lot of that stuff. I mean, books are the primary thing, but there are certainly book adjacent items in the collection. And at this point, I'm still pretty new to the Baldwin. I've not come up with any hard and fast collection policy about what book versus book adjacent will be coming in, but if it ties in with the book, I have a feeling certainly a at least some of it will be coming in. Space will always be a consideration. Where are we going to actually put them? We have everything right now on the shelves by size. And when you get the books and the toys and things that don't fit that, you have oversized things. It requires different ways of looking at it and planning, but I'm not ruling it out for sure. Ramona, here's a question from the chat. Uh, Jan Susina asks, well, I'm sure that this is addressed in B is for Baldwin. In addition to Carol, what other children's or young adult authors does the Baldwin have strong holdings in? So as I mentioned, and hi, Jan. So as I mentioned, um, we have a lot of Robinson Crusoe, probably Robinson Crusoe and Alice are the two largest. But we also have well over, I think about 100 of the Robert Louis Stevenson's A Child's um, Garden of Verses. A lot of the, what you think of as the golden age books are things that we tend to have multiple, multiple copies of, as well as the series books that I mentioned. That was good talk, by the way. I like, I enjoyed it. And um, especially the part about the New York Macmillan, Bech, uh, what was her first name? Louise. Louise Bechtel. Um, is there much more, or like are her papers here are much more than you, mm -hmm. than oh. you explained? Oh yes, there's a lot more to her. I've never heard of her before and uh, and I think that's fascinating. Jacqueline Eddy did a really amazing book called Book Women, and it looks at six women who really revolutionized children's books in the late 1800s through the early 1900s, and she's one of them. So it's looking at women who are editors, um, starting librarians, so kind of all these different forces, book women, um, coming together. And so that's definitely, there's a chapter in there about her that's definitely worth reading along with the rest of the book. But yeah, the Baldwin has a lot of her papers. We have her unpublished autobiography 
and a lot of her cards and letters from her authors and illustrators that she worked with when she was publishing, um, the haters were very prolific correspondents. We have lot, and big Christmas card people. We have decades of Christmas cards from the haters who are well-known illustrators from the mid 1900s. So we have quite a bit. And then, like I said, Vassar, her alma mater, also has a lot of her papers, as well as a lot of the children's books that she had in her home. She had all of her children's books in a room she called Mr. Winkle's room and a dog. And those books ended up at Vassar. Yeah, that, that was a great talk. Uh, did Bechtel have a counterpart in London? Not that I'm aware of. That's a fascinating question. I mean, and I don't know when they have a children's book division now. I don't know when they started the children's book division in London or how closely they worked together as they were getting formed, et cetera. But that would be a really interesting research paper. Well, I was just gonna add, I think it's a bit later. I think um, at Puffin, uh, was it K Webb maybe? There was a recent study um, of, of pub the publishing situation in, in England, children's division. And I think it was slightly later. I say it came yeah, later. I think that's right. And I think Puffin was the first big um, sort of imprint. And I'm pretty sure it was, I want to say Webb was the name of the person who was behind that. But I could be wrong. I know that um, Lucy um, uh, Pearson at Newcastle University is working on a history of 20th century. Uh, children's publishing um, in Britain. So. This is more of a comment than a question, but just I like you, I'm fascinated by the whole words of one syllable thing. Um, and as tangentially, I grew up in a house that eventually had 700 Robinson Crusoe's in it. And I have a house now that's full of Alice's. So I'm very at home here. But um, one of the last things Lewis Carroll wrote was an introduction to a book called The Lost Plum Cake by his cousin. And her approach, this is, this is 1897, 1898. Her approach was to limit it to words that had fewer than six letters, six letters or fewer rather than concentrating on the syllable idea, which came a little bit later. But it is, to my knowledge, it's one of the earlier books that sort of takes that very explicit idea of, you know, stating that we're going to, here's how we're going to, the rules by which we're going to provide uh, uh, something that's good for early emerging readers. No, I'd agree. That is one of the earliest I've heard of. Any final questions? So I think the next thing on the schedule is a lunch break for people here in the room. In a few minutes, you will be able to go get lunch over there. Um, you can eat in here. If it's nice enough weather, feel free to go outside. We've got some benches and things in the little garden out front. There also are tables. So if you walk around the back, I'm happy to show you or someone else can direct you there. For people in Zoom, I think Heather has just shared the, the Zoom link for your virtual lunch. And we'll try to put that up on a slide as well. And then we will see you back here after lunch at 1.15, I believe. Thank you very much. <laughs>